We continue our discussion of negotiable instruments. Now we've said already that negotiable instruments must be easily transferable. And to that, now we're going to talk a little bit more about transferability of negotiable instruments. Now negotiation, we said, is the process by which the transfer of an instrument occurs so that the transferee, the party to whom the instrument is transferred, becomes what we know as a holder. And the holder of an instrument has the right to enforce it, to collect the money. Now the holder of a negotiable instrument may enjoy greater rights than the holder of a non-negotiable instrument. Problems can arise if a defense exists to enforcement of a negotiable instrument. And we'll talk about those potential problems in a little bit. So today we're going to look at the transferability of negotiable instruments. Now after this lecture, you should be able to answer the following questions. What are the two ways that financial instruments can be transferred? How does negotiation differ from assignment? And what are the different ways to endorse a negotiable instrument? Now, there are a number of concepts surrounding transfer and negotiation. And we start with this idea that instruments can be transferred in two different ways. There are two different ways for a negotiable instrument to be transferred from the holder to the acquirer. And the first is a way that you should be familiar with from your LSB 3213 class. Contract law, contract principles permit a party to transfer a contract, the rights under a, a contract. So common law contract pr principles permit a party to transfer the rights that that party has under a contract. And this pro process of transfer according to contract principles, is called assignment. Now, in an assignment, the party assigning the rights is called the assignor. The party receiving the rights is the assignee, or assignee. And in an assignment, an assignee holds the instrument with all the same rights as the assignor. So in a contract assignment, whatever rights that the assignor had, those are transferred to the assignee. No additional rights are going to be transferred. This is under general contract principles. So what does this mean when it comes to an assignment? Well, when contract rights are assigned unconditionally, the rights of the assignor are extinguished. Instead, now the assignee has a right to demand performance from the obligor. Now, under the common law, under common law assignment, the assignee takes only those rights that the assignor originally had. And those rights, the assignee's rights, are subject to the same defenses that the obligor has against the assignor. So if the obligor has obligated itself to pay a certain amount of money, but it turns out that that amount of money was based on the fraud of the assignor, those defenses will apply even to a subsequent assignee. The, you can assert the same defenses against the assignee that you could have asserted against the assignor. And negotiation is different. Negotiable, negotiation involves transfer not by contract law, but by negotiation. Now, non-negotiable instruments can be transferred by contract law, but negotiation is a specific type of transfer, and it only occurs with instruments that are negotiable, that meet the standards that we set out in the last lecture. Transfer of an instrument by negotiation makes the person who receives it a holder. Now, 
negotiation of instruments depends on the type of instrument. So the method that is used is going to depend on whether the instrument is an order instrument or a bearer instrument. There are two methods of negotiating an instrument such that the recipient becomes a holder. And the method used depends on whether the instrument is an order instrument or a bearer instrument. The method negotiating order instruments. Let's start with this. An order instrument is negotiated by delivery with the necessary endorsement. An order instrument is negotiated through endorsement and delivery. So two steps are necessary in order to negotiate an order instrument. A party negotiates an order instrument to a third party by endorsing it in favor of the third party. So negotiating a check, for instance, requires both delivery and endorsement. If Mr. Smith took a check to the bank and gave it to the teller for deposit without signing it, it would be an assignment. The bank would be an assignee and not a holder. When the transfer fails to qualify as a negotiation, then it's an instrument, then it's an assignment. But if a party negotiates an order instrument to a third party by endorsing it, then it becomes a, um, a negotiation and not an assignment. Negotiating bearer instruments. Bearer instruments are negotiated simply by delivery. Delivery of the document from one party to the other. From the transferor to the transferee. There is no need for endorsement. A bearer instrument need not be endorsed to transfer the payee's rights to the transferee. A holder has the full rights to a negotiated bearer document. Now, there are different means of endorsement. What do we mean by endorsement? Again, an endorsement is required whenever an order instrument is negotiated. And generally, it's a signature with or without additional words or statements. It's made by the endorser in order to transfer her rights to the endorsee. And it's usually written on the back of an instrument. So this endorsement, this signature, is going to be made by the endorser. And what the effect of that signature will be is to transfer the rights of the endorser to the new acquiree, to the transferee. So the person who transfers a note or draft by signing and delivery is what we call an endorser. The person to whom the rights are transferred it's called the endorsee. An endorsement may or may not include additional words or statements, things like um, for deposit only or for deposit to a certain bank account number. We can add words and statements that may or may not affect the validity of the endorsement. And finally, an endorsement may be made on the document itself or be made on what's called an allonge. An allonge is simply a piece of paper attached to the document. It's usually done so when, in fact, uh, you've run out of room on the instrument itself for further endorsements. Now, there are different ways to endorse a instrument. And the first is what we call a blank endorsement. A blank endorsement specifies no particular endorsee and can consist of a mere signature. When we sign a check, for instance, when we endorse a check in blank, that means we just sign our name. And at that point, the blank endorsement transfers, transforms the order instrument into a bearer instrument. By signing the endorsement in blank, we have converted the instrument from an order instrument into a bearer instrument, meaning now anyone who possesses that check 
can assert the rights in that check. A special endorsement is an endorsement that indicates the specific endorsee to whom the endorsor intends to make the instrument payable. And after a special endorsement, the instrument remains an order instrument. Another type of endorsement is a qualified endorsement. A qualified endorsement disclaims any contract liability on the instrument. Qualified endorsements are often used by endorsers who are acting in a representative capacity, like the receiver of a business or a um, trustee of an estate. They are signing the instrument, but they're not signing in their individual capacity. They're signing in a representative capacity. So this is how qualified endorsements work. A qualified endorsement can be accompanied by either a special endorsement or an endorsement in blank. A restrictive endorsement requires the endorsee to comply with certain conditions. Meaning, a restrictive enforce endorsement is any endorsement on a negotiable instrument that requires the endorsee to comply with certain conditions. Now, a restrictive endorsement does not prohibit further negotiation of the instrument. What could we have here? An instrument prohibiting further endorsement. This would be an endorsement calling for payment only to a certain designee. An endorsement prohibiting further endorsement does not affect negotiation, but has the same legal effect as a special endorsement. It does not destroy negotiability. If I sign a, if I endorse a document pay to uh, Jose Arriaga only, that does not destroy negotiability. Uh, Mr. Ariaga can then negotiate the instrument just as if it had no restriction. Another type of endorsement is the conditional endorsement, an endorsement that makes payment of the instrument dependent on the occurrence of some event specified in the endorsement. A conditional endorsement conditions payment on the occurrence of a specified event. Now, the effect of this differs from the effect of conditional language that appears on the face of an instrument. Remember, conditional language regarding the promise to pay destroys negotiability. But conditional language in an endorsement is treated as okay. So say that Todd endorses a check, pay to interstate trucking if they deliver the lumber by May 1st, 2022. This is a... Um, restrictive endorsement, but it permits negotiability to continue. Endorsement for deposit or collection, this is an endorsement that makes the endorsee a collecting agent for the endorser, prohibiting further negotiation except by a bank or financial institution. If you've ever endorsed a check um, for deposit only, then that is an endorsement for deposit or collection, meaning the only thing that can be done with the check at that point is deposit into the bank. A trust endorsement is an endorsement to a person who is to hold or use the funds for the benefit of a third party. Endorsements that state there for the benefit of the third party are trust endorsements and legal title vest in the original endorsee. Now, there are other endorsement issues that often come up. Misspelled names, for instance, as a general rule, an endorsement should be identical to the name appearing on the instrument. However, when the endorser's name is misspelled on the instrument, she may endorse it, one, as it is incorrectly, and then two, as it should correctly appear, or can do both. Ideally, an endorsement should be identical to the name that appears on the instrument, but we can correct it if it's a misspelled name. It must be payable to a legal 
entity. So say we have a check that says pay to the order of Paul White, Harris County tax collector. This is an instrument payable to a legal entity that requires the endorsement of an authorized representative of the, uh, of the entity. Payable in the alternative, pay to the order of Tom Cat or Jerry Mouse, for instance, an endorsement payable to two or more persons in the alternative requires the endorsement of only one of the payees. So pay to Bob or Jill, meaning that either Bob or Jill can endorse that document. If it's a matter of jointly payable, pay to the order of Tom Cat and Jerry Mouse, or pay to Bob and Jill, this requires the endorsement of both payees. Courts um, often struggle with this, and this is a problem that occurs in real life all the time regarding the endorsement of a check. An instrument can be converted from an order instrument to a bearer instrument and vice versa. Now before negotiation, an order instrument can be converted to a bearer instrument or the reverse through an endorsement. So for example, a bearer instrument payable to cash can be turned into an order instrument by use of a special endorsement such as pay to John. An order endorsement endorsed in blank becomes a bearer instrument. Now the proper method of negotiation depends on the nature of the instrument at the time of negotiation. So the question is, is that an order instrument or a bearer instrument? Be careful of this on your test. Know that an instrument can be transformed depending on the endorsement. So in conclusion, what did we learn today? We've got a number of concepts surrounding status and negotiation. There are different means of endorsement. And finally, instruments can be converted from one type to another through the use of endorsements. And that's all. Thanks for listening.